Morning, boys. Just off out for a quick 70 miler if you fancy joining me. No, you're all right. Are you sure? <laughs> Greg, have you ever thought to yourself, why am I doing this? Now that is a very good question. My name's Professor Greg White. I'm an Olympian, a sports scientist, and an endurance specialist. And I've taken on multiple triathlons, including five Ironmen. But this year, I'm gonna take on my toughest triathlon challenge yet, the ultimate triathlon, the Norseman. The Norseman has been dubbed the toughest triathlon on the planet. The course requires competitors to leap off a passenger ferry at 4.30 a.m. to begin a 3.8 kilometer swim in treacherously cold waters. That's followed by a 180 kilometer cycle, where it's not only the headwinds that are the problem, but the very real threat of hypothermia. If they make it that far, the triathletes finish the race with a brutal 26 and a half mile run, the last section of which is up a mountain. It's an extreme triathlon which pushes even the most experienced athletes to the very limits of their endurance. 300 begin the race, far fewer completed. As an athlete and performance scientist, I've been involved in endurance sport for my entire life. As an Olympian, I competed in modern pentathlon, a multidisciplinary sport. I went to two Olympic Games, the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona and the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta, and won a silver medal at the World Championships in 1994. I'm also proud to say that I've been involved with Sport Relief, a worldwide aid organisation for many years. I've trained dozens of celebrities to successfully complete some enormous endurance challenges, including swimming the English Channel, cycling the length of Britain, and summiting Kilimanjaro, the tallest freestanding mountain in the world, twice, in order to help raise millions of pounds for people less fortunate than ourselves. But I don't think anything I've done before can truly prepare me for the Norseman, the toughest triathlon on the planet. It is going to be a brutal, physical and mental assault. Probably the toughest thing I'm ever going to face. But I am absolutely determined to be wearing that Norseman black t-shirt at the end of the race, even if it kills me. Actually, if it does kill me, do you want to cut that little bit out? The Norseman is a race within a race. The first 160 competitors pass the final checkpoint, ascend the mountain, and are awarded with a Norseman black t-shirt. The remaining competitors go around the mountain and are awarded with a Norseman white t-shirt. The Norseman white t-shirt is a badge of honour amongst triathletes. The Norseman black, however, is something very special indeed. Missing that all-important cutoff can be heartbreaking. I'm making this film for, for two reasons. I think firstly, it's actually to provide a guide for aspiring triathletes or triathletes who are currently doing sprint and Olympic and want to move to long course triathlon of how I process training, how I approach the way in which I prepare for long course triathlons. I think secondly though, and most importantly, is actually it's about age. And I think in society, what we tend to do is we tend to assume that as we get older, we are less able. Uh, and what I want this film to be really is a demonstration that actually as we age, we can still achieve incredible feats of physical prowess. Yes, there are differences, we do change. So, so the way in which I train now is different to the way I trained when I was a junior athlete. But modifying that training, recognizing that I don't recover as rapidly as I used to, but modifying that recovery approach. So taking modifications of the training, what I know is that at 52 years of age, I am not on the scrap heap. I can still continue to achieve. I can still continue to push myself to the absolute limit and achieve success. So I think overall, what I want this film to be is a message to people to say, if you believe, you can achieve. Preparation begins eight months out from the event as Greg begins to condition his body for the three triathlon disciplines, cycling, running, and open water swimming. January was brutal. Getting up at 5 a.m. in the dark and those weather conditions, the snow, the sleet and the hail makes it really, really difficult. But in the week, it's the only way that I can do it. I have to get up early so that I can get to work. Importantly, on the weekend, starting early means I get to spend that valuable quality time with my family. It's really important. 
Preparation is central to success in any challenge. But as part of that, the primary touch point, the most important part is the mind. Mindset is everything because mindset drives success in all other areas of that preparation. And so for me, I use a mantra and that mantra is nothing good comes easy. So if ever I'm in a training session, even before I start a training session, if my mind starts to wander, I bring myself back to those four very simple words. Training is not a series of random events. It's planned and the structure of that planning is absolutely crucial. And what we have is we have periodized training. So within that periodized model, you have the long-term goal, the macro cycle. That is then dissected down to a meso cycle, these medium-term goals, all the way down to micro cycles. And that, they are weekly and daily goals. And at the end of the session, I can look back, I can reflect on that session and see if I have delivered on what the aims of that session were. So I use this concept of reverse periodization, which effectively means that I'm trying to get to my predicted race speed. So I, I predict a speed that I want to be at for the Norseman. And then having hit that speed, what I then do is go longer and longer. The brick sessions are absolutely instrumental to any triathlete. They are a central part of training because they are technical, tactical, physiological, psychological. They work everything simultaneously. They are brutal. And what they are is simply a transition from one discipline to another and repeating that. So anyone who's done a triathlon before will know what it's like, the jelly legs when you get off the bike. Well, actually that's trainable. And if you repeat that in training with brick sessions, that will improve. In the winter season, when it's difficult to get open water, I spend much of my time focusing on speed and speed endurance. And that really is shorter repetition. So it's 100 efforts, 200 efforts, anything up to 400 efforts. And then the speed endurance comes by repetition. So, so one of the classic sessions that I often do is actually 100 100s which is a brutal two and a half hour session because I take them off 1.30. But incredibly difficult to do. But what that is, it's not necessarily particularly quick, but what it is, it's about trying to maintain that speed over time. And that's what, that's what Ironman Triathlon is about. So to a seasoned open water swimmer, 3.8 kilometers of the Norseman swim leg may not seem that far, but it's interesting because what you have to do is layer the environment on top of that. The first thing is the mass start. And the mass start can feel like an absolute washing machine because everybody is fighting for their space while still trying to swim in a forward motion. It can be an incredibly scary place if you're inexperienced. And so therefore, making sure that you can handle that, that you don't expend too much energy early on is absolutely crucial. The run's an interesting one because actually the distance doesn't phase me. What does concern me is the end of the run, up a mountain. And I have a history of Achilles and calf injuries and hills are fundamentally the nemesis for both of those areas. One of the key things which is now central to performance enhancement is this idea of marginal gains. And what marginal gains is, is actually looking for small margins of improvement, lots of those across each of the disciplines. And when we accumulate those small differences, they can actually make a massive difference to overall performance. And that can be the difference between winning, losing. It can be the difference between not finishing and finishing. So for me, with the cycling being the weakest of my disciplines, I knew that was where we start with marginal gains. For years, I've been riding Oro bikes from the iRide team based in Brighton, and they came up with an absolute beauty for me to ride in the Norseman. But a bike is just a machine. Getting it to fit for you and work for you, that's a whole other science. Next up on my journey was to get my all-important race suit sorted, and for that, I'd nip up to Derby to see the team at Hoob. This, this suit, we tried to combine aerodynamics, which is the huge play right now, because 80% of, of your drag in triathlon on a bike is your body. So we're trying to put the aero benefits into a suit that's it's, it's going for extreme conditions. Well, if you look at the shoulder, this fabric has ribs in it. You could be led to believe that everything has to be really smooth to go through the air faster. Well, this isn't. We, we're tripping the air, we're turbulating it, we're taking any vacuums away from behind the body. So you're going faster for, for less effort. And then when you look at the legs, 
You know, we're a company born in rubber and wetsuits. And here we've got neoprene trips. This does patent pen and it's cutting edge. It's tripping the air, it's turbulating it. And again, you're going faster for less effort. You've heard of marginal gains. This is significant gains. Next on my journey was a trip up to Worcestershire to Olympic legend Chris Boardman's training facility. First off, Bianca Broadbent had the unenviable task of examining the pressure of my undercarriage on the saddle. With a new saddle sorted, next Bianca turned her attention to my feet. The right shoes, and crucially the right insoles, could help create a far more balanced power output through the pedal. More power means more speed. More speed means I get to that finish line faster. Oh. It's something for clear, it's got some work to be done, hasn't it? Uh, I'd say no hope for the plie. Eh? No, no. Enough, no, 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 is actually just slightly higher than when we were looking at a human performance vehicle at 55 miles an hour. It's very draggy. We've got a lot of work to do. So you say he has, he has a swimmer's chin? Yeah, I've got wide shoulders, um, very straight back, which is you know great one of those aspirational things for everyday life, but it's not very aerial. Um, and it means that when you roll down and you've got to round it back, it's great for going fast, but it's probably losing about 30% in terms of aerodynamics, but the whole event that he's approaching is a compromise. You've got to be able to swim, you've got to be able to run, and, and the bike riding is just a portion of it. And that's, I think, the fascination of it is, it is a combination of different things, and you're trying to weigh up what's best to compromise. Well done, really good session. Oh, Covered a lot of ground. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, in realistic terms, in the time trial position, we've found you just over a kilometre an hour uh, improvements in speed, yeah. 20 watts saving in power. Yeah, I'll take that though. Take I mean, that is, you know, 20 watts, you think about it, that is two months training. Try and push the pedals hard by 20 watts, you soon know about it, certainly over those hours out on the bike. Well done, Greg, it's been an absolute pleasure having you in. Well, thanks for having me. Good luck. Well, thanks. I'm going to need it. You are. <laughs> I mean, you asked me the other day about why I'm doing this, and, and there's multiple reasons really, but I think family is at the centre of it. I was really fortunate enough to have an incredible mum and dad who didn't push me, they supported me through everything that I wanted to try and achieve. You know, my dad would regularly take me up and down the country to swim meets, to track meets on a continual basis. And my mum was the rock, you know, she was at home, she was fueling me with some, you know, fantastic food to keep me going, doing the washing, doing everything for me on a continual basis. And, and sadly, they're no longer with us, um, and, and I miss them every day. But I think what, I, what really matters to me is that, that I, in their legacy, is I want to honor that legacy by continuing to push myself, to, by continuing to be as good as I can possibly be, because it actually goes on. And I think part of that as well is about showing that to my children, is that I, I'd love my children to think about me like I think about my mum and dad. I want to be a positive role model for them. I want them to watch what I do and be inspired by that. And I think crucially as well is, is to remember that it's, it's, it's about giving your best. It's about 100% effort. I often say this to my kids, and it's not about winning. If you cross the finish line and you've given it everything you have got, that is all you can ever ask of yourself. And I think it doesn't matter whether it's sport, whether it's life, whether it's business, whether it's family. If you're giving it your best, that's all you can do. I learned that from my mum and dad, and what I hope is that my kids will learn that from me and will reflect on that after I've gone. Those 5am starts for training are totally worth it when you come back home for this, Pancake Saturday. I always say that recovery is king, and this is how I recover with my family. Penny, yes. what's it like being uh, married to a triathlete nutter? tiring <laughs> um it's good i've only ever known greg as a sports person so that's all i ever know and i do sort of get it because i've done some sports before and yeah it's a commitment <laughs> that's a, that sounds a bit harsh but yeah <laughs> so guys what do you think of um what do you think of daddy going off and doing all these crazy triathlons Oh, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Apart from when he left us and went to Hogwarts.
Hawaii without us. That's true. How do you feel about him going off to compete in the toughest triathlon on the planet? Nervous, worried, and sort of can't wait to get it over and done with. Because he goes out training for hours and hours on end. You just want him to walk back through the front door and it all to be okay. And it's a bit like that with the race. I just want it done and to get the phone call and for it all, all to be fine and dandy, really. <laughs> to come back alive, basically. Well, do you remember that time that you went out on your bike and you, I literally got a knock on the back door and there's Greg stood there with blood down his leg, down his elbow, where he'd come off his bike. But he did come home. So. I made it home though. That was the main thing. Yeah, <laughs> but it is it is a bit worrying. Yeah. But I mean running along and all of a sudden you just feel a little tightness in the calf around the Achilles and then all of a sudden it moves to the point where you have to stop. And lots of things go through your mind at that point. Obviously, the worst case scenario is that it's over, that you've injured yourself so badly that you can't go on. Uh, fortunately, I knew it wasn't that because I'm experienced with, with that sort of injury. This is a reoccurring problem with, with my uh, both calves and both Achilles. Uh, and to some extent, it's age related and, and also longevity. I've been doing this, this stuff for so long now uh, that I do pick up injuries. And of course, as I get older, they take longer to recover from and, that, and that's the real worry in the back of your mind because as soon as as soon as you feel that injury the first thing you're thinking is is it over and then thinking to yourself well, it's not over the next question is how long is it going to take to recover easing up on the cardio whilst you heal doesn't mean that you ease up on the training strength and conditioning training in the gym is vital particularly during rehabilitation keeping your body race ready and your mind focused on the job in hand. What is always in the back of my mind is that success, success is only driven by finishing. And so the support team that you have with you is absolutely crucial. And, and for me, we've got, we've got that crew and that crew is brilliant. And particularly as part of that crew is my old mate, Bawley. Uh, who is a lifelong friend of mine. We used to compete internationally together. He's a formidable athlete in, in his own right. Uh, and and he, he'll be supporting throughout, but critically on the marathon, he's actually allowed, uh, allowed to come out with me and to run alongside me, particularly on the mountain. Principally because he, he carries my body down <laughs> if it all goes badly wrong. <laughs> what do you think uh, Greg's chances are of, of successfully completing this? It's, it's a tough one. I mean, for Greg, very high. I mean, there's nobody with uh, better mental resilience than Greg, but it's going to be brutal. It's going to be a really, really hard day. It is an extreme Ironman triathlon, so the, the run leg and the bike legs are going to be extremely hard. Um, but if anybody can do it, it'll be Greg, and I've got full faith that he will get through it. Um, but it's going to be tough. I have given it everything. I have left no stone unturned in training. I have worked as hard as I possibly can. I have optimized my marginal gains. So I know that when I step onto that boat at, at, four, at four o'clock in the morning to jump off into that freezing cold fjord, I have done everything I can. I will do everything I can to win that Norseman Black. And whatever the outcome is, I know that I've done my best. Nothing can really prepare you for Norway. It's raw, it's beautiful. It feels like nature is winning. The day before the race, competitors get a chance to settle their nerves with a little taste of the fjord. How are you feeling, how's the water? It's all right. <laughs> Seen the very stable, look. There's that little tang of salt in it. No, it I... is, uh, it's brackish. <laughs> brackish. That mix of, good word. Okay. <laughs> Salty, yes, nice though. I mean, look at it. Stunning, absolutely stunning. Assembling the bike is such a nerve wracking experience. So many questions fill your mind. Has it survived the journey? Are all the bits there? And most importantly, can I put it all back together? If you could do, if you could do that the whole way, Adrian, I'll pull you. <laughs>
<laughs> when we're going uphill, if you can do this uphill, it'd be great. So, I mean, this is glorious, Dag. I mean, is this usual for the Norsemen? Actually, it isn't. Uh, the west coast of Norway is, is infamous for its uh, wet uh, weather. Yeah. Uh, but for this region, Eidsjö is actually the driest place in the region. It is race day tomorrow. What can I expect? If the weather conditions that are um, forecasted now, uh, if it sticks to that, you'll have a fantastic swim. Uh, you will love the bike and you'll be quite warm on the run actually until uh, you start getting up into elevation again. Yeah. And you also need to take into consideration that, that uh, for every 100 meters of elevation, uh, the temperature will drop one degree Celsius. Yeah. So even if it's 20 degrees Celsius here in the morning, uh, when you go into T1, you will most likely have six, seven, eight degrees uh, at the plateau. So, uh, which, which can be quite nice when you, uh, when you ride hard. When you're working, when you're working hard. Yep. So I've got to work hard, is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah. <laughs> On the boat is the point of no return. You look around and you can see people are anxious about what's about to come because they're about to push themselves to their absolute limit for over 15 hours. To jump into the fjord at, at 5 a.m. to start a two and a half mile, 3.8 kilometer swim, you know, for many, the fear is palpable. All of that training through the purgatory of a British winter is irrelevant unless you deliver on the day. Uh, there, is, there is no shortage of adrenaline prior to the start of a, of a massive challenge like this. Many of the other athletes had thought about the swim. They were prepared for the swim. What they weren't prepared for was what looked like a five meter jump into the darkness, into the abyss. For me, it was the real point of excitement. I mean, I love that. It was, it was the point at which, when you left that ferry, the race began. Getting to the start line is really quite something. The rush of adrenaline is incredible, and you've really got to control it. You try and focus, and then you hear it. It's chaos in the water, arms and legs everywhere. It's totally disorientating. The only way through it is to push forward, to sight as best you can and push on to that first transition. Second out of the water, it was a great swim. I was really pleased with that, but we're into T1, transition zone one. And for me, it's the much forgotten element of triathlon. It it's, can be make or break to, to, to a triathlon itself. That you can throw away months of training by being too slow, by not having your kit where it should be ready to go. But of course, there's a whole host of things that you can't, you can't predict and I think one of the key things here was for me was cramp. Going from this supine position in freezing cold waters all of a sudden into this change of position and then trying to get your shoes on etc and the hamstring cramped up and, and that's a real worry because actually there's nothing you can do about cramp per se. Once you get it you've got it and cramp can end the challenge.
on the bike now, and, and this is the point of greatest fear, because this is my weakest event. I am a swimmer on a bike, and this is the Norseman. 55 kilometers of continuous uphill to the highest plateau in Europe. And it's only at that point that the real climbing starts. Second out of the water, there's only one place to go, and that is backwards from that point, particularly as the cycle is my weakest element, and now the strong cyclists start to come past me. And I think what can happen at that point is you can panic, and you, you deviate from the plan, and the key is to stick to the plan. They are gonna come past me, I know that, and what I need to do is actually use them just to pull me along. This imaginary rope that as they come past me, I pop an imaginary rope around them to drag me along towards the finish. Good work, YG, you okay? Let's have some, let's have some drink. We're gonna give you another bottle at 90 and 10 k's time, yeah? How's your food going? The support van came past and, and the shout came from the van, 90 kilometers to go. And immediately I'm thinking to myself, three and a half hours already done. Three and a half hours of uphill purgatory done, but I'm only halfway. When it comes to the conditions, the environmental conditions, I'd spent nine months preparing for cold. You know, every, every message, every image, Every conversation was about how cold it was at the Norseman and that hypothermia was the real damaging factor. Low body temperature was gonna be the real problem. But of course, on this particular day, the temperature was high. It was the complete opposite of that. It was the reverse of that. Hyperthermia, overheating, was the real problem. And so managing that on, on an ongoing basis was absolutely crucial. I mean, constantly climbing up and up and up. And again, as a swimmer on a bike, it's not my natural territory. And what goes through your mind, you have to be very careful to control it, but what's going through your mind, when will this ever go downhill? Because we can't keep climbing constantly. It must go downhill at some point. But the Norseman is such an event where it's just relentless. Five hours in, 100 kilometers done, still 80 kilometers to go. And, and the overwhelming sensation is of fatigue, but it's exacerbated by the temperature. It's just so hot, unexpectedly hot. Uh, and with the lack of acclimatization, it really does make it incredibly tough. And of course, as well as losing fluid constantly through sweating, what that also does, it becomes abrasive in those areas you expect it to be abrasive in. So at this point, it's time to stop and reapply some more anti-chafe cream. And, and as I stop, nature called, and I've got a rule, answer when nature calls. This is going to be great in 4K, bro. <laughs> but you know, Bully has seen it all. Uh, so the fact that I was weeing on his shoes whilst he was applying anti-chafe cream and pushing food into my mouth simultaneously, I mean, the glamour of ultra endurance exercise was personified at that point. I never feel like stopping. I, I, lots of emotions come over me about how difficult it is and how hard I'm working and how happy I'll be to finish and get off this bike. But I never think about stopping. I run this principle of the happy bank. What I think is the brain is a bank of happiness and training is investment into that bank. So when it gets tough on the challenge, when it gets to those really, really tough points, what I can do is I can withdraw happiness. The more training you do, the more happiness you've got to withdraw. 130 kilometers in and now the real climbing starts. Having this incessant climbing up to this point, I look ahead of me on the road and realize that we are going up and we are going up steep. And still at this point, people are passing me. And in the back of my mind, what I'm thinking is black t-shirt. That's all that's, that's all that's coming to mind. And I'm thinking to myself, where am I? What position am I in? Am I in that top 160? And it's actually the fear of dropping out of that top 160, which is driving me on, despite the fact my legs are broken. My will is close to breaking point. It is 
arduous at this moment in time with still 50 kilometers of the cycle to do, followed by a marathon. Hundred and forty kilometers in, the only way that I can describe it with a hundred and eighty degree hairpin bends climbing this mountain is alpine. It's like being in the French Alps. No longer are these hills, these are mountains. At one point I looked down at my speedo and it read 1.5 miles an hour. And so steep was the mountain, but all I could think about was how am I staying upright on this bike? It's at this point that it becomes really risky. Utterly fatigued, going downhill, and panic ensues because now I'm thinking to myself, where am I in the race? I've lost a lot of ground because cyclists have come past me, and now I want to make up that ground. And so at this point, having spent 150 kilometers going uphill, I am refusing to use the brakes. And I top out going downhill at 48 miles an hour taking risks that you would never normally take, but it's being driven by the black t-shirt, this desire to get into the top 160. So I arrived at T2 and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking it's over. My weakest discipline, the bike is done. But the key question is at what cost? The endless uphill and critically the heat which we hadn't predicted. What toll had that taken? And we're about to embark on a marathon run in incredible heat, mid 30 degrees centigrade. And all I can think about is how am I gonna cope with this? Add on top of that, the Achilles on the right side had flared up as it had done throughout training. And then on exiting the transition, just that hamstring reminded me, it tweaked again as it had done in transition one. It's these type of injuries that suddenly take over your mind. And, and instead of it becoming a race, it's actually a battle of survival. Into the run and it is brutal. The environment is brutal. We're in a valley in the shadow of this mountain that I hope to climb and temperatures soar above 30 degrees centigrade. And it's, it becomes oppressive, not a wisp of wind coming down this valley, nothing to call you as I'm running along. And it's a battle of attrition against the environment. So hot was it, I remember Baldy coming alongside and pouring room temperature water on my head, and it felt like ice cold water being poured over me. deep into the run now and people continue to go past me and at this point I'm really starting to ask myself questions. Everything is screaming. The Achilles that I've tried to protect for months on end is starting to come back, starting to really hurt. The cramping which I'd experienced at T1 and at T2 is now starting to re-emerge. The heat is utterly oppressive. I feel like I'm being boiled as I'm running along. Everything feels like it's starting to go wrong. At this point, the idea of the happy bank is starting to become a real issue, is that you have almost exhausted all of the happiness, all of the training that you've done, and this now becomes a battle of wills. You are now fighting yourself. I dissected the run down into kilometers, so instead of thinking about how far I had to go, I just thought about the next kilometer constantly in my mind saying, just keep going, come on, push and drive and push and drive and keep pushing. And if we keep pushing one foot in front of the other, one kilometer at a time, I'm gonna get to the finish.
Motivation is so important, particularly in the latter part of, of the race when, when things start to get really, really tough. And I always draw on the things that are closest to me for motivation, and that's my family. And, and what my family think and, and how they reflect on it really matters to me. And, and what was great for this particular race was my, my two young daughters actually painted my fingernails before I went out on the race. They painted Union Jacks on my fingernails. And every so often, I would just get a glance of them out of the corner of my eye. I'd actually see those painted fingernails. And I think, I think to myself, I'm doing it to make them proud because they want me to achieve. And if they want me to achieve, I can achieve it. 10 miles to go and looming large. Not only is the mountain, but it's the race to the black t-shirt. Where am I? What position am I in? I've got seven kilometers to go to get to the cutoff point, to be in that top 160, to race for the black t-shirt. 25 kilometers into the run, the vast majority of the race done, and I take a left-hand turn, and at that point, Baldy joins me, uh, which is a, an incredibly important respite at this point but ahead of me is 10 miles of climbing. And we start the climb with this notorious zombie hill. I joined my broken brothers and sisters climbing this unrunnable hill in this slow attrition upwards towards the summit at 1800 meters, still with 10 miles to go. On the climb, I looked around and I saw other athletes starting to relax, starting to take it easy, starting to take their foot off the gas. But for me, that was the point where I thought to myself, push on, keep driving, keep pushing. The fear of the Norseman Black kept driving me on, but there was no way at this point I was gonna give up any positions. I was gonna make up positions to make sure that I was in that cutoff zone at the right point to continue up the mountain. As the cutoff point got ever nearer, all I could think to myself was, have I done enough? Have I done enough? I made it. The cutoff zone, top 160, and I had actually achieved the Norseman Black. All of the work, all of the effort from me my team, my family had come to fruition. We were gonna to achieve together a Norseman Black. It was incredibly emotional because it was the relief almost uh, of, of actually getting to that point. Between me and the finish though was six miles of mountain to climb. And you only get a black t-shirt if you cross the finish line. How difficult could it be? The final climb was utterly relentless. It just kept on going and going. And, and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, when will we ever get there? And I'm reminded about my kids in the car who say, are we nearly there yet, daddy? And that's what it felt like because every corner you looked up and it just continued on. And the terrain was brutal. I mean, it was rocks and boulders. It was ankle breaking territory. It was not a place to make a mistake. The final stage of that climb was truly magnificent. It was exhilarating. We were in Norway, in one of the most beautiful places on the planet, but actually it wasn't the Vista that came to me, it was just the steps in front of me, the near vertical climb, these final meters to get to the finish. But having driven so hard, having worked so hard on this race and having been supported by such an incredible team, it was, just became emotional. The final element was just, it was, it was the realization of a very long process, a realization of a dream to get the black t-shirt. And that's what kept driving me on. And everything else 
faded into insignificance outside of the finish line, which was in touching distance. To cross the finish line was like no other experience. Anybody who's done an ultra endurance race will know that that point when you cross the finish line, the, the weight of the world is lifted from you. And, and the reason you often fall to the ground is because all of a sudden it's, it's a different place. It's almost gravity is different crossing that line. There's just a sense of euphoria that firstly it's over. You don't have to take another step. There is no way, there's no more distance to do. You've actually done it. Inspiration. Nothing good comes easy, man. And that is proof of it. How are you feeling? I am too tired to be elated. <laughs> I just, you know, I am proud. Proud, sorry. What was great from the team as well, that they knew exactly what to do for me. So Andy uh, had bought beers uh, at the top. The only rehydration strategy that actually works. Well done, A beer never tasted so good, which was a positive because it was the most expensive beer in the world. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> but let me tell you, it was like an angel crying on your tongue. Just having finished the race was the first opportunity I had really to, to look around and to actually take in the incredible beauty of Norway. Absolutely stunning. And actually to think that the Norsemen delivered. It was everything that everyone had told me it was. It was everything that I expected it to be. It was brutal from start to finish, it, but it was so incredibly well organized. It was like a family that everyone said it would be as we were going along. Athletes, supporters, officials alike, everybody was willing everybody else to the finish. But it was a brutal assault, physically, mentally, emotionally. But to stand there and realize that I had achieved what I set out to do and I had had an experience that, that can't be replicated anywhere else other than in the Norseman was just such a sense of excitement, achievement and pride. Having successfully completed the toughest triathlon on the planet, there was just a nagging voice in the back of my mind. And that nagging voice was saying to me, so what's next?